Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm Tommy Kidd. I'm the Associate Director of Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. And we're sponsoring this lecture this afternoon, along obviously with Truett Seminary, and so glad to have you here. Uh, if you don't know about the Institute for Studies of Religion, we sp sponsor lectures and symposia on a lot of different topics. Uh, ob obviously, we have people who work on religious issues across a whole range of disciplines here at Baylor. Uh, obviously, religion, Truett, uh, sociology, history, uh, philosophy, and uh, we even have an epidemiologist we work with, so, so a lot of different topics. Uh, and, and today's uh, lecture is very much in our wheelhouse. We're delighted to have you here, and we're thankful to Truett, as always, for, for hosting uh, this lecture. And so I, I, to introduce our speaker, I want to bring up Dean Todd Still, Truett Seminary. Thank you, Professor Kidd. We are grateful for the partnership that we enjoy with the Institute for the Studies of Religion in general and for your collegiality uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Kidd. It's my honor this afternoon to introduce uh, to those gathered Professor David Babington. Dr. Babington holds two degrees from Cambridge including uh, the PhD, which he earned there in 1976. Since that time, Dr. Bebbington has taught at the University of Stirling in Scotland, uh, where in 1999 he was afforded the honor of a personal chair, now professor of history at the University of Stirling. If you've never been to Stirling, uh, you should haste yourself there remarkable castle, incredible context. Dr. Bevington has taught in other places in addition to Sterling, including the University of Alabama, Birmingham, Regent College, Vancouver, the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, University of Pretoria in South Africa, and then, of course, at our beloved Baylor. Here, this term, he is serving as the Distinguished Visiting Professor of History. In 2016, Dr. Bevington was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Dr. Bevington's research interests are broad-ranging and stimulating, including the history of politics, religion, ideas, and society in Britain from the 18th to the 20th century, as well as in the history of the global evangelical movement. His publications are many, I have chosen seven to draw to your attention, not only because Dr. Bevington and I were suggesting prior to the lecture that this is the perfect number, but also because it's the number of students enrolled in his seminar at Truett Seminary this term. Evangelicalism in Modern Britain, about which I shall say more in but a moment, 1989. The Mind of Glass Stone, uh, Religion, Homer, Politics, Oxford. 2004. The Dominance of Evangelicalism, The Age of Spurgeon and Moody, InterVarsity 2005, Baptists Through the Centuries, A History of a Global People, Baylor University Press 2010. Victorian Religious Revivals, Culture and Piety in Local and Global Context, Oxford Press 2012. Evangelicalism and Fundamentalism in the United Kingdom, during the 20th century, Oxford University Press 2013, and then most recently, at least to my knowledge, The Intellectual Attainments of Evangelical Nonconformity, a 19th century case study in 2014. The first volume that I mentioned, uh, namely uh, the volume um, uh, sorry, as I turn back to it, uh, I apologize, Evangelicalism in Modern Britain, is uh, the uh, place where Dr. Bebbington sets forth that for which he is now widely known, namely the Bebbington Quadrilateral. For it is there that he identifies four main qualities uh, or attitudes or convictions emanating from evangelicalism. Biblicism, crucicentrism, conversionism, and activism. During his 
illustrious career, Dr. Bebbington has exerted a large in, uh, amount of uh, effort and a considerable influence in placing evangelicalism on the world map of religious history. And through his efforts, uh, have made it more difficult for scholars to ignore the influence of evangelicals in the world. And as one who self-describes as such, a word of gratitude is extended for your work, Professor Bebbington. Well, it would be difficult to imagine someone more capable or qualified to address the topic of the hour, namely evangelical preaching in North America in the late 20th century. Would you please join me in welcoming to Truett and to this ISR lecture, uh, Professor David Bebbington. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me say a word of thanks both to the Institute for the Study of Religion at this university for the invitation and to Truett Seminary for the location. I appreciate both. I'm very glad to be back at Baylor this semester. I actually found it rather hard to get here. Government places enormous number of obstacles in my path, I find. Every time I visit, there are harder and greater number of questions to answer. Let me give you a sample of the questions I had to answer this year in order to obtain my visa. And I do not kid you, this is an authentic question asked this year for the first time. This is on the U U United States visa application. Have you, while serving as a government official, been responsible or directly carried out at any time particularly severe violations of religious freedom? I answered no, <laughs> therefore I am here. And my subject this afternoon is not violations of religious freedom, but evangelical preaching in North America in the late 20th century. The source for this lecture is my own service notebooks. For half a century, it has been my hobby to take notes on services I attend. Not just the sermons, also patterns of communion, choice of hymns, types of prayer, everything in fact, including hats and heresies. Most of my notes are on Britain, but from my very first visit to the United States in 1989, I've kept notes on North American services as well. And I want to use those notes as the basis for this lecture. My evidence, therefore, is unchallengeable. <laughs> the period that I want to cover is the late 20th century, the very late 20th century, because the period is only 1989 to 2000. But for this period, I do have a total of 30 sermons as my database. Now, it is a relatively small, evidential foundation, but as we shall see, that sample of 30 sermons gives full scope for fruitful analysis. So what is included in my sample today? There's great variety, from brief homilies of 11 or 12 minutes to one vast discourse that lasted 62 minutes. What are the geographical distribution? Well, you'll be relieved to know that none is from Waco because I had not yet visited Baylor when this material was collected. Therefore, this afternoon, I shall be letting no cats out of bags. But the geographical distribution is pretty broad. More than a third are from Illinois or Indiana. Another third are from North Carolina, Florida, and Alabama. And the remainder are from Canada, British Columbia, Ontario and Nova Scotia. That means that, there are, that this set is far from representative of the whole of North America. There's nothing from the East, nothing from New York or Washington, nothing from the West, nothing from California at all. And yet, this group of sermons does reflect North and South, and I think one can detect the authentic flavor of the South 
in one or two of what I'm going to talk about. In one North Carolina sermon, for example, there was a testimony. And the testimony included reference to souls ripe for picking. And I couldn't help thinking when I heard this that this was cotton country. I think the two are connected. So, North and South are both represented as well as three parts of Canada. What of the denominational distribution? Well, nine services were from the Reformed tradition, four Christian Reformed, five from different uh, Presbyterian denominations. Eight were Baptist, Southern, Northern, General Association of Regular Baptists, African American, and a Reformed Baptist. Thirteen were from a variety of other traditions, Anglican in Canada, Methodist, Christian and Missionary Alliance, Pentecostal, Vineyard, Church of Christ, Christian Brethren, and Undenominational, that most denominational of denominations. Although there are omissions from this group, Lutherans, Congregationalists, for example, I would suggest that this is a fair cross-section of the evangelical world of the 1990s. The variety was evident in the fieldwork. One Presbyterian church followed the sermon with a prayer by John Calvin. And another Presbyterian church had a, held a celebration of the Lord's Supper according to Scots form, as they called it, with white cloths over the tables. Now, I'd never heard of this in Scotland, but nevertheless, this was held to be Scots form. And I do suspect, actually, that it does reflect 18th century practice to a significant degree. In the sermons, Presbyterian preachers dwelt on covenant and reformation, reformation of worship in particular. That is, traditional reformed themes. The Christian reformed congregations included men with Dutch names and Dutch beards, reflecting the reality that the Christian Reformed Church was once the Dutch Reformed Church. And there, the preachers dwelt on grace, almost uniformly. Here, then, were the characteristic features of the Calvinistic tradition. The one Methodist preacher, by contrast, insisted on the universality of the gospel invitation. He was self-consciously Arminian, not Calvinist. Similarly, one of the Anglican preachers dwelt on something particular to his denomination. He preached not on scripture, but on a passage from the Book of Common Prayer, the traditional liturgy of the Church of England and its daughter churches elsewhere in the Anglican Communion. Prayer, the traditional liturgy of the Church of England, these things were, in, were felt their way into the sermons, as one would expect. And individual details reflected the ethos of other denominations. A Church of Christ speaker called his address not a sermon, but a lesson reflecting the rational principles of that denomination. And a Christian Brethren message started with brothers and sisters, reflecting the terms still in regular use in that body of Christians. Likewise, a sermon by an African-American preacher referred familiarly to Clarence Thomas, the black justice of the Supreme Court, without identifying him or his position at all, because the preacher could assume that he was known to the congregation. A dispensationalist notably referred to the rapture, the meeting of believers with Christ in the air, that features prominently in the dispensationalist theological scheme. And an undenominational charismatic, in a congregation where there had been a word of prophecy, stressed that the role of the Holy Spirit was central. He, the comforter, would empower believers in their Christian walk. Thus, the sermons reflected the preoccupations of the denominational groupings from which they came. So, the multiform character of the evangelical mosaic was very apparent to this observer. Yet, so was the common ground occupied by evangelical Christians. Evangelicals, as has already been suggested this afternoon, 
share special emphases on the Bible, the cross, conversion, and activism. All these were repeatedly dwelt on in the preaching that I heard. That was certainly true of the Bible. A, a congregation of fundamentalist disposition illustrated some of its deepest convictions by a very solid wooden pulpit at the front, carved with an open Bible on the front. One sermon was on the subject, can the Bible make a difference? Another warned against misinterpreting the Bible, taking Hal Linzel's books on biblical prophecy as its instance of misinterpretation. A third, preaching on the power of the word of God, insisted on the doctrine of in inerrancy. Now, not all the preachers I heard would have shared the inerrantist view, but the priority of the Bible as a source of divine knowledge was uniform. The version of the scriptures expounded, however, was not uniform. We had the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, both were in use, but the New International Version was more frequent. And interestingly, the King James Bible was just as frequent. And on one occasion, the King James Version was used in the pulpit, even though the new RSV was provided in the pews. There clearly remained an affection for the King James Version that went very deep at this time. Whatever version was read, however, an emphasis on the Bible was clear throughout the sample. In the second place, the cross was a common theme. One preacher referred incidentally to what Christ did on the cross, knowing that his hearers would understand without any fuller explanation. At Willow Creek Community Church near Chicago, the atonement was the culmination of the address. At another congregation, the preacher called the cross simply the expression of God's love. Elsewhere, however, there were much more detailed elaborations. At a conservative Presbyterian church, it was explained that since Christ was sinless, the penalty he bore on the cross was unjust, and so the Father would not allow him to remain dead unjustly. Not, I think, a classic exposition, but nevertheless one that was fully elaborated on that occasion. Another preacher, on the other hand, while speaking of Christ's suffering punishment on the cross, declared that the resurrection was even more important. That put him, I would suggest, nearer the boundary of evangelicalism than some of the other preachers, and yet even he brought his sermon to a climax with insistence on the fact of the cross, as he put it. The atonement, an enduring evangelical priority, remained so in these sermons. Conversion, thirdly, was a repeated theme. An African-American preacher told the members of his congregation, even though they were holidaymakers attending an open-air service at Disneyland, that they must be born again. A Canadian preacher challenged his hearers by asking if they had received new life. And the Churches of Christ speaker put his denomination's particular understanding into his exhortation to repent, believe, and be baptized. It is true, surprisingly, that a Christian Brethren evening meeting, normally called the Gospel Meeting, did not contain any reference to conversion, even though it was a very traditional assembly. Yet, invitations to respond to Christ then and there were common features of the sermons. One preacher encouraged his hearers to make use of prayer counselors straight after the service. The speaker at Toronto Airport Vineyard Fellowship called on his hearers to give their lives to Christ, and 30 people went forward at that single service. So conversion, both in theory and in practice, was a marked feature of this sample. Activism, the fourth hallmark of the evangelical movement, I have to confess was rather less obvious in the sermons. It may be that evangelicals were assumed to know the need for action in spreading the gospel, and so exhortation to do so was sometimes thought superfluous. The theme of activism did, however, emerge, and it was most obvious in two sermons urging social action. 
Two representatives of evangelical social ventures spoke eloquently on this subject. A visiting preacher who ran a charity for needy children in New Jersey asked his Canadian hearers to support that ministry, declaring that his staff workers looked into the eyes of sick kids and saw Jesus. Another visitor, again promoting a youth social agency, asked the members of the congregation whether they were willing to get up and go in response to the call of Christ. He was clearly used to talking to young people. Not everybody over the age of 60 stirred. It is true that activism was not so prominent in these sermons as the other three main features of evangelicalism, but nevertheless, it was present. It is clear that despite the enormous heterogeneity of evangelicalism, the sermons displayed the salient characteristics that bound the movement together. What then were the basic characteristics of this set of sermons? We can examine the settings, the preachers, the audiences, and the themes. First, the settings. The places where the sermons were delivered showed great contrasts. The Christian Brethren address was given in a small and functional hall of an extremely unecclesiastical appearance. Other buildings, however, were very ecclesiastical, like Duke University Chapel, and or very large, like a huge Assemblies of God Church in North Carolina. Most buildings were comfortable, but one Christian Reformed Church in June was definitely not. There was no air conditioning and the temperature was 91 degrees. The immediate place for the delivery of the sermon was usually a pulpit centrally placed. In two buildings, it was not central, but to the right. In an Orthodox Presbyterian church balancing a font on the left, and in a very respectable African-American Baptist church balancing a reading desk on the left. In one case, there was no pulpit, but only a reading desk. In another, there was neither. Where there was a pulpit, it often conveyed a message of its own. At the African-American church, for example, the pulpit fall displayed a cross and a crown, reflecting the memories of suffering and the anticipations of glory so powerful in that community. Similarly, at the Assemblies of God, the pulpit fall showed a flame representing the fiery experience of the spirit. By the 1990s, the decade under scrutiny, the setting also commonly included technology. It allowed amplification of the speaker's voice, never in these instances causing any problems, unusual in my experience. Several churches had erected projector screens, usually primarily for the words of the songs, but also sometimes to help the preacher. At one church, the text appeared on the screen, the Willow Creek, the screen delivered notices about childcare in the vast complex of the buildings. The Assemblies of God congregation, but no other in this period, inserted a video clip into the sermon. So the setting usually assisted the preacher by providing a sound building, an elevated place for the delivery of the sermon, and beneficial technical facilities. Beyond that, the setting varied greatly. The preachers I heard in the second place also varied. Some were eminent. Tony Campolo was an ethicist then from Eastern Baptist Seminary who had gained a reputation as an unconventional speaker to young people and was later to provide pastoral support to Bill Clinton following the scandal towards the end of his presidency. Dick France, an able New Testament scholar, was principal of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. William H. Williman, who recently spoke from this platform at Truitt, but who was then Dean of Chapel at Duke University, enjoyed high rank amongst the preachers of his generation. And two of the most significant evangelical leaders of the 1990s were among the preachers in the sample. Bill Hybels of Willow Creek and Jim Arnott of Toronto Airport Vineyard Fellowship, the epicenter of the Toronto Blessing. Yet others among the preachers were humble, local pastors, or else even laymen. 
An elder preached at two Christian reformed services, and of course, the Churches of Christ and Christian Brethren, both rejecting the practice of ordination, had lay speakers. The difference in the experience of preparing and delivering sermons was often very evident. That is to say, the lay people did not attain the standard of their ordained equivalents. The preachers, furthermore, sim symbolized the different styles by their dress. Presbyterian ministers wore gowns, combined in different instances with a sash, a scarf, or an academic hood. William Williamon, officiating in Duke Chapel, wore a white cassock and red scarf emblazoned with doves to match the design and colors on the frontal of the communion table. It was Pentecost Sunday, hence the doves. An Anglican clergyman, wore a white cassock to preach, as had become customary in his denomination, even though his evangelical Anglican predecessors in the 19th century had denounced that practice unsparingly as an aping of Rome. All these ordained men, in different ways, were asserting the dignity of their office. By contrast, a Christian reform minister wore an open-necked, short-sleeved shirt. He too was making a statement. He would open no sartorial gulf between him and his parishioners. Both strategies were forcefully brought to the attention of their hearers by the appearance of the speakers as they preached. The hearers themselves, thirdly, had different degrees of involvement in the sermons. The majority expected to do no more than listen or even, in a few cases that I noticed, fall asleep. But quite a number became involved in the preaching. More than one congregation provided an order of service on which sermon notes could be written. The Pentecostal preacher required his audience to repeat the words after him, for God so loved the world. These were from words on an electric screen Though several members of the congregation, I noticed, which included many who must have received a very poor education, stumbled over those words. One Christian reformed preacher opened by asking those present to suggest qualities of God from Psalm 145, much in the manner of the leader of a Sunday school class. Almost certainly, this preacher was carrying over into public worship what he actually practiced in a Sunday school class because he was a lay elder. An even higher level of audience participation was urged at a Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. This denomination, much influenced by holiness teaching, had long been averse to public display. Hence, it's perhaps not surprising that the preacher broke off at one juncture for a two-minute interval so that members of the congregation could express their repentance of their sins and show their sincerity by removing their jewellery or shoes. Here, then, was an expected physical response within the sermon. Spontaneous responses included laughter, especially during the Pentecostal sermon, and a cry to Bill Highballs at Willow Creek of, ain't that right, Bill, from a bearded newcomer to the church. Congregational cries of amen or the like, might have been expected, but I didn't actually hear any in any one of these 30 examples. Part of the explanation lies in the fact that the one African-American congregation where amens could have rung out had become extremely decorous. The men all wore jackets and ties, and many women wore very beautiful hats. A shout during that sermon would have been out of place. By and large, then, the congregation was passive, rather than active during the preaching. The themes, fourthly, were indicated by titles, texts, or both. Titles included the moment of decision, for whom the bell tolls, or, and this is my favorite, absence makes your faith grow stronger, the title of a sermon on the ascension. The, <laughs> the texts, form an instructive study. They ranged from a single verse to a fairly long passage of scripture. 19 were from the New Testament, eight from the Old. 
Of the 19 New Testament texts, nine were from the Gospels, four from Paul, two from Acts, and four from elsewhere. The New Testament, therefore, though only one-third the length of the Old, received more attention than the Old. And the Gospels provided texts for about half the New Testament sermons. There was therefore no obscurantism here, no deliberate seeking out of obscure passages. For three sermons, there was no single passage chosen. Two of these were delivered at Willow Creek and Toronto Airport Fellowship, and will receive fuller comment later. In general, however, the practice of the preachers was to root their messages in particular passages of scripture. Here, I would suggest, is another symptom of the biblicism of the evangelicals. Beyond the basic characteristics that I've reviewed of settings, preachers, audiences, and themes, other features of this collection of sermons can be analyzed. Firstly, and most obviously, the content. Theologically, the content ranged over a wide span of Christian doctrine. Some sermons tended to the sterner side. These included one given in a charismatic congregation that referred to Satan with some vigor, and another in a Pentecostal church that referred to hell with some force. Others tended to be mild. Two preachers, for example, one Christian Reformed, the other Presbyterian, dwelt almost exclusively on the theme of love. Here was evidence of a drift in two opposite directions by sections of opinion within the evangelical world, the sterner and the milder parties. Again, ecclesiastically, there was a contrast of position. A strongly Calvinistic Baptist church heard a warning against falling into superstition, by which the preacher meant Rome. But at Willow Creek, the Roman Catholic pastoral writer Henri Nouan was mentioned several times with approval. There were, in fact, no anti-Catholic remarks apart from the single one of the Calvinistic Baptist Church. On this issue, therefore, the tendency of the times was definitely to abandon the traditional polemic against the Roman Catholic Church that evangelicals had maintained from the 18th century. On gender questions, the same Calvinistic Baptist Church was the most distinctive. There, the audience heard a very firm injunction that wives were to submit to husbands, said with a certain relish by a husband. In another congregation, by contrast, there was actually an ordained female pastor in the pulpit. That congregation was the broader-minded half of an orthodox Presbyterian church that had split on the gender issue. Those in favor of female ministry had formed the evangelical Presbyterian congregation that I attended. Broad-mindedness, however, could go much further than that. The African-American Baptist Church, the preacher urged his hearers to find the real you and to feel good inside. He was very much an exercise in psychology. Authenticity was the goal. Here was an instance of the growing therapeutic evangelicalism that was to blossom even more in the following decade. This teaching would have been hotly contested in the more conservative congregations I attended. It is another sign that the content of the sermons displayed a distinct tendency to polarization in the period, both over doctrine and over practice. Conservatives and progressives were moving apart during the 1990s. Secondly, rhetoric. The preachers I heard used a variety of techniques known to the ancient rhetoricians. The most obvious was the addition of a passage of application at the end. After the doctrine, the practice followed, a common pattern in preaching down the centuries. Another specific rhetorical device employed in a sermon was inclusio, to begin and end the sermon with the same point. In one case that I particularly remember, the preacher started by referring to his dislike for cabbage, because he associated cabbage with an unpleasant particular moment in his past, and he ended by referring again to cabbage. There was inclusio. <laughs> 
A common device, again inherited from a multitude of previous preachers, was the use of numbered points. As in the past, three was most common, but there were also cases of two, four, and even six points. One sermon of 37 minutes managed to combine two blocks of points. The first had four facts about the gospel, and then there were three about keys of intimacy to Christ. Sometimes, in three of the 30 cases, alliteration was used for the key words of the points. In the six-point address, for example, successive points about the transfiguration and its aftermath were confirmation, confidence, confusion, conflict, compassion, and comprehension. Such rhetorical devices helped communication and perhaps sometimes, perhaps, helped the memory too. Thirdly, illustrations. The art of sermon illustration has been the subject of whole books. It was widely practiced by the preachers whom I heard. There were, it is true, absolutely no illustrations in the sermon delivered by a Churches of Christ evangelist. Each point was enforced, but solely by other Bible passages. The result was a markedly dry discourse though one that appealed to the very ratiocinative members of that congregation. Illustrations elsewhere enlivened what was said. The Christian life, according to a frequently deployed image, was like that of a sportsman in training. The principle that prayer must be followed by action was illustrated by a rather strange story. The story went like this. A Mormon woman who prayed fruitlessly for the closure of a liquor saloon in her city had a servant who heard her, who went out with a box of matches and burned it down. <laughs> the point, I think, was that action was more effective than inaction. Other illustrations were frequently drawn from personal experience, whether of falling in love or of speaking to other people. And there could be intriguing links between anecdotes told in the people. Thus, in Alabama, I heard a story told of how Texans always brag. A few years later, admittedly beyond the period I'm talking about, I heard in Texas a story about the follies of the people of Alabama. <laughs> both, both of these tales went down extremely well with the audiences. <laughs> there can be no doubt that the illustrations provided irrigation for the sermons. They prevented aridity. Fourthly, citations. I tried to no doubt in the names of the authors whose words were either directly quoted or else alluded to with respect. There were only a handful, perhaps surprisingly. Only one American religious writer was cited, and that was to censure him, Hal Linzel. By contrast, there were three authors from Britain, and they were all approved. Robert Layton, the 17th century biblical commentator, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and John Stott, the then contemporary evangelical Anglican leader. There were two continental authors too, Henri Nouwen and Albert Schweitzer, a German polymath and missionary. It is possible that the source, or the author of my source, was not very competent and failed to record some names, but I do think that the result shows that outside influences were in the minds of some of these North American preachers, but perhaps in the minds of rather fewer than one might reasonably expect. These then were the general features of this set of sermons. What I want to turn to now are the exotic examples among them. I have selected three case studies for more detailed analysis. <clears throat> the first was a reformed Baptist church in central North Carolina. It was exceedingly insistent on reformed doctrine. It used a an orthodox Presbyterian hymnal, although itself was a Baptist church, just to show how reformed it was. At the door, there was a pile of the Banner of Truth magazine, a Calvinistic journal published in Edinburgh. Although the building was a very recent one, it had an austere wooden pulpit 
and benches that were equally austere and very painful after a short while, which were designed to create the atmosphere of a traditional meeting house. Clearly, this congregation had appeal. The evening congregation attracted 200 people, mostly younger folk, many with small children. Three-year-olds were expected to sit through the sermon. Two-year-olds were allowed to go to sleep. The preacher was supported by the congregation in training at Trinity Ministry Academy in New Jersey. His sermon, as I've mentioned already, lasted 62 minutes, with the two-year-olds sleeping in front of him, the three-year-olds listening. He preached on a single verse, that is the older pattern which took a single verse as a text, on Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The subject then was ministerial training, what he was undergoing, and he had three points. Firstly, the nature of gospel ministry, and he emphasized proclamation almost exclusively. He criticized the average evangelical churches of his day for taking a different path. They were said to be commonly bright and flashy. Ministers, he said, were tempted in his day to political activism, whether of the left or the right. And they were reducing the role of the minister to concern with the physical, whereas he should proclaim spiritual truth. Second point, which he reached after 28 minutes, <laughs> was the mode of discharge of the ministry. Negatively, he said, it was to warn. Positively, to teach. Instruction was to be of a local flock. The preacher insisted, with some, at some length, that his hearers must be in good standing with a local church with the purpose that they could receive instruction. That is the function of the church, to receive. Thirdly, the goal of the gospel ministry. And that was to help the congregation reach maturity in Christ. At this point, the preacher, unfortunately, came rather unstuck. He came on a sheet of paper that had been misplaced and started reading what did not continue from the previous sheet. That this did not create laughter. This was a very somber occasion and a sober congregation. So all that happened was that the preacher did a bit of diligent shuffling and then carried on as though nothing had happened. He went on to depict the gospel ministry in all its dimensions. Brethren, he concluded, not, not sisters, of course, brethren, what else do you want? There was no response. The patience of that silent congregation was astonishing. Here was the deliberate creation of a traditional world by artifice. It was a, con a very conscious imitation of the Puritans. Here it was that Robert Layton the 17th century author, was invoked. In a sense, therefore, this was highly retrospective. But in another, it was pioneering because this was at the cutting edge of the reformed revival of that generation. It was very much banner of truthy, as I've suggested, and part of a rising phenomenon, which is much stronger now than it was then. That, then, is my first case study. My second is the Willow Creek Community Church on the outskirts of Chicago. The setting was a vast auditorium with padded theater seats, very comfortable. Early in the service, the theme of finance was introduced by an extremely slick presentation. Four people sat on church pews at the front, passing collecting bags back and forth and asking questions of each other with a very witty repartee. And it was a satire on church life, and it drew enormous applause from the audience. Later, an assistant pastor introduced the subject more seriously. The question of giving, he suggested, seemed too personal for public discussion. But, he said, the Bible says so much about God and money that we must talk about it too. When the offering came, it was announced that this was not for visitors, so the congregation was actually practicing what it preached. It was giving itself but not forcing others to. When it came to the sermon, Bill Hybels, the senior pastor, 
did not stint. He gave us 42 minutes. The structure was unusual. Its method can be called reverse exegesis. Instead of starting with an examination of the Bible, he started with analysis of an aspect of human experience, financial affairs. Only subsequently did he turn to the Bible. Heibels asked the members of the congregation to pretend that they were approached by, to be financial consultants to a church. What principles of giving would they advise? He suggested, firstly, participation. Members must be challenged to contribute. Secondly, proportion. Not the same amount should be expected from everyone, but something that was a percentage according to each person's means. Thirdly, consistency. The church needs are regular, so income needed to be regular too. Fourthly, anonymity. There should be publication of financial sums received. Sorry, uh, the giving should be confidential. Nobody should be told uh, what other people were giving. And fifthly, encouragement. There should be publication of financial sums received so as to foster emulation. Each point was justified with sound and wholly pragmatic considerations. Only then did the preacher turn to scripture. What he asked are God's principles of giving. He turned to texts and found that God's principles were participation, proportion, consistency, anonymity, and encouragement. The five were identical. That was the dramatic moment of revelation. And Heibel's concluded by encouraging systematic giving on this pragmatic and divine basis. The two were the same. But he also, at the end, turned to those whom he called seekers. When they understood that Christ died for their sins, he suggested, they should join a congregation that does not waste its time on raising cash. He thus tied a gospel challenge into his theme of finance. Here then was a sermon catering for the actual concerns of the very largely prosperous audience, one that definitely made money. It was profoundly contemporary, profoundly relevant. It's no accident that the church bookstore included three full bays of books on psychology. Willow Creek was the inventor of seeker-friendly services. It was also the inventor of seeker-friendly sermons. Thirdly, the Toronto Airport Fellowship, when it was still a part of the Vineyard Network. I visited Toronto Airport in 1995 when it was the scene of the Toronto Blessing. This was a striking phenomenon with nightly meetings that went on, except on Mondays, for 16 months before I attended nonstop. It caused great controversy because some of the manifestations which were marked at the Toronto airport didn't seem very divine. Animal noises were common, especially dog barking. But this gathering attracted people from all over the world. On the occasion that I attended, there were 30 people from the British Isles at that single service. There were a total of 1,300 people, roughly, in the very utilitarian modern building, a former conference center. Much of the service, in fact, was given over to testimonies from various countries. One was particularly moving. A mother who had lost a baby to terminal illness spoke of how she'd come to terms with her loss through the fellowship of that church. Others who had lost children themselves were invited to the front for prayer ministry, and many people went forward. There was much weeping, but there were also some obviously relieved faces. That did seem to me a very authentic form of ministry. Jim Arnott occupied most of the 43 minutes of his sermon with anecdotes from the revival in which he felt he was participating. People, he said, had sought and found the reality of God and the manifestations were part of the package. At one point, he was interrupted by a woman laughing, a typical symptom of events there. Arnott paused to comment that this was not the Toronto blessing, but the Father's blessing, and received a round of applause. Afterwards, there were those who wanted personal ministry, 
and stewards arranged them in lines so that they could fall over safely into the arms of catchers who were carefully located when they were slain in the spirit subsequently. This was the quintessence of the charismatic renewal of the 1990s. Yet it was emphatically evangelical. The sermon was a pastiche of scripture references. All it spoke of God sending his son to die in our place. There was an exhortation to give, up, give our lives to Christ, and some professed to do so by raising their hands. And the congregation was urged to Christian witness. Christianity, Arnott said, has to go forth in power. Here then were Bible, cross, conversion, activism, all there. In the year that I heard that sermon, Arnott published a book affirming Jonathan Edwards' criteria for evaluating revivals, not according to phenomena at all, but according to scriptural evidences. Here then was distinctive late 20th century spirituality, but it was firmly rooted in evangelical tradition. What then can be concluded about evangelical preaching in North America in the late 20th century? There was great variety in the sermons, and yet they displayed a shared evangelical emphasis on Bible, cross, conversion, and activism. The settings, the preacher's fame and their dress, the degree of congregational involvement all again varied, but the preachers did all take pains to draw their address from scripture. In content, there are indications of the polarization between the reformed and the charismatic leanings that were emerging in the 1990s. Rhetoric, illustrations, and citations were deployed in very different ways, and there were striking instances of the tendencies of the times in the case studies that I've looked at. The reformed approach taken very rigorously in North Carolina. The seeker-friendly and charismatic methods exemplified at Willow Creek and Toronto. Perhaps through the diversity, there was expressed something mentioned by the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Ephesians. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God was made known. It was manifold, but it was also the wisdom of God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, and if, when you are uh, called on, I think you want to call on people. If you could just stand up and, and speak loudly so we can, so we can hear you. And there's a, there's a microphone there too. So if, if you want to go to the microphone, that'd be great. Do you want to make your way to the microphone so, to, to set the... And I'm, I'm going to, to uh, ask a question to mm. kick us off. Um, it seems like you're, you're drawing uh, generous boundaries about who counts as an evangelical. And, and I, I wondered if, if off the top of your head you could think of a service that you went to that you knew you were not in an evangelical church and, and what, what, what the sign of that is. <clears throat> My preference was for going to evangelical churches, um, not just for fieldwork purposes, but also for reasons of edification. So the majority were evangelical, but I agree some of them were more evangelical than others. That is to say, some insisted on the core elements of evangelical, evangelicalism more emphatically than some others. I mentioned one where there was a stress on the resurrection that almost eclipsed the atonement, and that is rare amongst those still within the evangelical boundaries, but he was just about within those boundaries. Yes, I did attend some other congregations. Uh, I attended some, um, I, I attended one Unitarian Universalist church, for example, in New England. Uh, I wanted to go to see what the Puritans were like in the 20th century, and I was shocked. <laughs> uh, the Puritans were no longer Puritan. Above the pulpit, there was a sevenfold motif showing the symbols of seven great world religions. I thought that was very exclusive, actually. It didn't include several of the religions that I quite like. But nevertheless, seven were actually symbolized. And clearly, universalism was not just a hope for the future. Universalism 
was a form of syncretism. That was definitely beyond the bounds of evangelicalism. There were others that were closer to the boundary. There was one um, Episcopal cathedral I went to <laughs> for even song on a Sunday, and there was a congregation of two people, and the service was not distinctively evangelical in any sense, but then it's very hard for an Episcopal even song in a cathedral to be so. Uh, there was no homily. So it was very difficult to judge. Very nice man, though. He chatted to me afterwards, and I, I valued going. Um, that is to say, yes, I do not think you can understand evangelicalism without understanding non-evangelicalism uh, as a methodological approach. Field work must go wider than what you're studying to look at comp comparable, equivalent setups in whatever field you're in, and that will be true here. Well, I'm Beth Allison Barr from History Here, and I have several questions, but I'll just ask you two. Um, and so one of them is probably obvious to you, but you mentioned that the focus on the cross, of course, was a common part of these sermons. So I'm curious, as a medievalist, if you paid attention to the liturgical year with the sermons that you went to, did these happen to mostly be sermons that were in the spring, um, or did they span? Did the liturgical year not, not matter for the emphasis on the cross? So I'm curious about that. And then the second thing I'm curious about, this is of course right before the, on, the onset of the ESV translation. And since it comes from the RSV, I'm curious what the who, what congregations perhaps were using the RSV or uh, as opposed to the NIV, which was the other one that you mentioned, you said that there was still this, this comfortable familiarity with the KJV. Um, but I'm curious about the difference between the NIV and the RSV or NRSV that were used. And if you think there could be any pattern correlation with um, evangelicals picking up the ESV, which they did of course in the early 2000s, so. Thank you. On the first question, um, indeed, the liturgical year was evident, and it was most evident, oddly enough, not at one of the Anglican services I attended, but at the Methodist service I attended in Duke College Chapel. That was, without doubt, the highest Methodist service I have ever attended, much higher than most Anglo-Catholic services. Its overall liturgical practice was exalted. It would have dignified a cathedral in the 14th century. The, the practice was, uh, th there were no censors, there were no funny smells, but apart from that, the, 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 there was the full paraphernalia. Um, and it wasn't just that I happened to go on Pentecost Sunday, I did, that, that created the sense of liturgy, liturgy being important, but the preacher obviously had decided to use Pentecost Sunday as the vehicle for his sermon, and his sermon was a fascinating one on the way in which the bells of Duke College Chapel should continue to be rung despite student protests which had been frequent in recent weeks because they symbolized the gift of tongues proclaiming the gospel to all nations. And it was brilliantly interwoven. It was one of the most memorable sermons I've ever heard. This was William Willimon, a great preacher by any criterion. So, yes, there was the liturgical year. However, my practice was normally to, to manage to go to the United States and Canada in the summer. And the summer is a very unfortunate time liturgically, as you will be very familiar. It is the dead season. It was the Sundays after Trinity, as they were still called in the 1990s, Sundays after Pentecost, as they're now called, distinctive for no particular reason. Um, during the uh, one or two feasts have been replanted in the summer in the recent past in the Anglican Communion. Uh, the transfiguration has been transferred from the winter to the summer to make it more palatable. Um, but that had not happened in the 1990s. So the liturgical year was not very evident in the liturgical churches. However, liturgy happened even in the Brethren Assembly. The Brethren Assembly had a prayer which had categories of people who were prayed for which were identical to the categories of people who were prayed for when I had last been to a Brethren Assembly 30 years before. Their liturgy was identical, although I had never been to the North America before to hear their liturgy, but the liturgy was identical on opposite sides of the Atlantic. Those who were non-liturgical 
do have liturgical tendencies, even if they're not medievalist. Secondly, uh, on Bible editions, um, it was evident in this period that the NIV was the most popular one with evangelicals, apart from the conservative ones who believed in everything old and therefore had the King James Bible. I don't think any of the congregations I went to thought the King James Bible was the only version of the Bible you should use. I have subsequently been to congregations where that is definitely insisted on. I went to one only a couple of weeks ago, a fascinating experience. Um, I think that quite a lot of the congregations that were using the NIV then would have gone over to the ESV by now. Clearly, I don't know, because I didn't go back to these places. That's one of the sad things about these congregations that I talk of. Most of them I've been to only once. The congregations of Waco, by contrast, I've been to multiple times. I therefore can discern change over time, which allows for much more penetrating analysis. So. Thank you. Was there much discussion about denominational lines in the church services? Um, if so, what was it like? If not, why do you think that was? There was no explicit beating of denominational drums, but there's a great deal of implicit teaching that reflected the distinctiveness of the denomination, most obvious in the Calvinist-Arminian divide that I mentioned. Um, and I suppose that everything that was said in the Reformed Baptist congregation during the 62 minutes was designed to enforce their distinctives. That is to say, the insistence that the preaching should be given to a congregation that was regularly ordered and regularly attending is very distinctive of that tradition. There's nothing in the text about the congregation being properly ordered, but proper church order was very important to that Reformed Baptist congregation. So it was, as it were, uh, introduced by implication and insisted on at some length. And that's, that was the general tendency. Um, if I'd been to, say, a Methodist church when they were collecting for Methodist missions, then I'd have heard more about what was distinctively Methodist, I think, etc., etc. So by and large, not, not enormously so. The tendency of the 1990s, which of course has been enhanced in subsequent decades, is for denominational emphases to recede and for uh, what evangelicals in general or Christians in general or people in general hold together to come to the fore. So I would suspect that the tendency would be even weaker now than it was in my period. I'm curious about uh, the, the body of evidence you've collected from Britain, of course, <laughs> I'm a British historian, um, and the comparison that you might make between the two. I'm sure you find four areas of commonality uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, but um, was, was, is there something from, the, from this body of evidence that seems distinctively American, or do you find yourself instead interpreting what you see in the 90s in America as part of a more global story? Two features of churches in America in general in the 1990s struck me and saddened me. They were, number one, that there was a lack of emphasis on the public reading of scripture. A few churches did it, but some churches did not at all. The other was a, an extraordinary deficiency in most of the congregations of intercession. There was prayer, but it was about what went on in the congregation. Um, I'm not saying that British churches are perfect in either respect, far from it. However, one would expect there to be public reading of scripture and to be intercessions. Um, unless there were tendencies that had gone pretty deep-seatedly in opposite directions, which are true in a few isolated cases. But th those were different. On the more favourable side, the, the were, there was a very marked phenomenon in the southern churches, which I hadn't been used to, but I've become very used to now, and that is the appeal at the end of the service. That is the invitation to people to come forward, um, to step up the aisle. That is something that is exceptionally rare in British churches. I had encountered it, but the chief way in which that was noticed in Britain was when Billy Graham urged it at his, at his crusades in the UK. 
and that, of course, is an import from this part of the world. So I think that, that was the most striking thing that I noticed that I hadn't been used to, but that, of course, was not universal. Uh, that didn't happen in some of the northern Presbyterian churches. However, despite the differences, what strikes me most of all is the similarities. The things that were alluded to by way of books, as I mentioned, were British literature, by and large. And subsequently, I found that again and again and again. The favourite person to cite in sermons uh, that I've heard in the United States, and admittedly this is weighted towards Baptists, is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He is being quoted more than any other single person. And you'll be delighted to know, therefore, the 19th century wins in that respect. However, I would say that that points me to a general principle which I do believe quite strongly, which is that in the existing secondary literature on the history of the evangelical movement, not just in relation to preaching, but in relation to everything else, there is too much emphasis on what is distinctive either of Britain or of America, because people who write about one haven't actually written about the other. Only those people who live in one country and write about the other have special privileges and special assets for doing that sort of analysis, and we look forward to more of what they write in the future. It was overwhelming the former. Um, that's not surprising because a lot of the Bible is about that. Um, however, I think there was a distinct inhibition about applying the principles to broader issues. I mentioned that there, there was no absence of social concern. The, the, the several sermons, apart from the two that I singled out, did call upon the congregation to be socially engaged to help the poor and the disadvantaged, especially young people. However, there was virtually nothing, I think, in that body of sermons. Yeah, there was nothing. That's right. There was nothing in that body of sermons. I, I would have noted it down if there had been. But there was nothing that was explicitly about contemporary socio-political public issues. Now, there's an interesting contrast there. In the sermons that I've analysed for the 21st century, there's a companion paper to this, and that's based on a database of 200 sermons, a much larger body, there is much more socio-political engagement. It does seem to have grown in the places that I've been in the 21st century. And that's within the evangelical world. I'm not talking about beyond, where that sort of engagement might be more readily expected. Um, but that is one of the changes that I registered between the 21st century and the late 20th a growth in that area, possibly to be seen as a growing confidence amongst evangelical biblical expositors that they could speak with sufficient acceptance on questions of broader import relating to public issues. I, I would put it down in some measure to that, in some measure also to the pressing issues of the time, clearly. Um, you talked a little bit about gender, but I was curious, I'm sure this is a predictable question for me, but that's all right. Um, for churches that did not have explicitly ordained women, were there women participating in the service from the front, or was it very distinctly mostly male? And has that changed over time? I'm curious about your more recent um, visits as well. <clears throat> It was quite marked that in some congregations, couples were encouraged to sit together. Oddly enough, genders were encouraged, as it were, to get to be close. One thing that I did find striking about the 1990s experience of the churches in America was shock that men put their arms round women in church. That would never be known in the United Kingdom at all. That was a total novelty. Now, this was clearly encouraged, not least in conservative congregations, because that affection was supposed to symbolize the bonds between man and wife, or 
I'm not sure all were yet married, but getting that way. Um, clearly, that was deliberately fostered. It wasn't accidental. It was, it was a custom in many congregations of many times, especially conservative ones. In terms of women doing things separately, however, um, it was rare. I think in one of the churches, a woman read the Bible reading. That was quite a common phenomenon in the 1990s, and I'm pretty sure that took place in one, but I think only one. Um, oh, a very interesting test of the, de the uh, degree of conservatism of the congregation is the proportion by gender of the stewards taking the offering. A very, very sound test, which I do actually register. And in some of the congregations, the broad-minded ones only, women did that. Women were allowed to deal with money, therefore, but not many other things. When I started going to churches around here, the role of women became broader, and I, I, I was intrigued to find that in some of the African-American churches, there was a specific order of women who were organized to help at the services. And that I found rather attractive, not least when they brought a towel round to help mop the brow of the preacher during a revival service. <laughs> that was good. Was there a time in the services that you went to that uh, allowed the congregation to meet and greet one another? If you noticed this, then were you personally greeted and did you feel welcome? And as kind of a, a related, but not the same question, how were you treated overall in some of these services as a visitor? Did you blend in the background or did the clergy single you out and spend time? Let me repeat those questions since it was from near the front. The first was, uh, was there a time in the service when people meet, met and greeted each other, including me? The second question was, did I feel welcome? On the first question, yes, in some of the services, there was a time towards the start when um, people were encouraged to exchange greetings. They were usually encouraged to exchange greetings in ways that they preferred, which I appreciated. Um, one or two which actually encouraged hugging, I appreciated less. Um, <laughs> those, that, those that had a respectful form of decorous handshake, th th those were very acceptable. Um, this, however, became more common in the 21st century, so it was only some. It was growing, but it became more common subsequently, and is almost de rigueur in many of the churches I go to now. Um, on, on, yeah, my degree of comfort with it varied according to the mode. On the second issue, what, did I feel welcome? I think I did. Um, there was one service, no, it wasn't a service, it was a prayer meeting in this decade where I did not feel welcome. It was a charismatic prayer meeting and it was during the time when um, Hillary Clinton acting for her husband was actually trying to pass a form of Medicare. It was a failure, it didn't work at that juncture. This is the prehistory of Obamacare. And um, there was prayer explicitly offered that this would be put down, that this would not pass, because we do not want to have socialised medicine such as they have in Britain. Now, since I very much appreciate the med medical care of the National Health Service, I did not appreciate this public service inspired by Christian principle being prayed against. That I found painful. That is the only instance that I recall of actually not feeling welcome, and obviously one could get over that, and one does, one has to. Um, I, I, what does, does strike me about churches in America is they do go out of their way to try to make people welcome. There is just occasionally, I have to say, a far more stylized version of making people feel welcome rather than a more spontaneous form. It's the more spontaneous form that I prefer. But nevertheless, even the stylized form shows that people do want to make you welcome, and I appreciate that too. And I think that in each congregation I could say that. In many cases, I was taken by a friend, and that helps. That helps enormously. When I'm round here, I'm less often taken by a friend, and so I'm astonished that people accept me as much as they do, because an odd person taking notes towards the back could seem highly suspicious. <laughs> well, uh, is there one more question? All right. 
Yeah, go ahead. Because I was going to individual churches on one-off visits almost entirely during the 1990s, it was almost impossible to estimate the frequency of the observance of the Lord's Supper. Subsequently, that has been one of the features that has struck me most as being a difference between the United States and Britain, especially amongst Baptists. I think I have missed the one occasion when I could take communion at the church I go to regularly here in Waco this year. In four months, I think it'll be observed once, and I've missed it. I find that an enormous loss. I find it hugely detrimental. At my own church in Scotland, all Baptists in Scotland, in fact, observe this, there would be communion every Sunday. And that was actually required by our title deed to our former premises. If ever we fail to have communion on a given Sunday, the premises will be ipso facto forfeit. Therefore, to go from every Sunday communion to communion once a quarter, if you can happen to be there, that's an enormous difference. However, that's not something that I experienced on this visit. In terms of theology, there was a tendency to downplay um, the role of... Uh, the, the two received Protestant sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that during this period I heard them referred to as not sacraments but ordinances. Subsequently, I've heard that quite a number of times, especially in Baptist churches, and I don't agree. Um, but uh, that is, again, a significant difference, I think, between the two sides of the Atlantic. But it will be difficult to go deeper on the 1990s per se. My experience of that is much fuller subsequently. And I intend to write a disquisition on worship amongst the churches of Waco and District, and I intend to publish that just after I visit Waco for the last time. (laughs) Well, on that ominous note... (laughs) Thank you all very much for coming out, and let's uh, thank David Bevin one more time. Thank you.